Elizabeth Blackburn won the Nobel Prize for her discoveries at the molecular level of how the ends of chromosomes, the so-called telomeres, work. It's a fundamental mechanism. So this week in the Dow, I'd love to meet Elizabeth Blackburn. She's a Hobart girl like me, um, both come from the same small town in Australia and she's gone on to pretty great things. The ends of the chromosomes consist of a special DNA sequence that is repeated many, many times. The enzyme telomerase, which makes the ends of the chromosomes, is really important because if you have not enough telomerase, the cells stop dividing. And this is basically what you call aging. But when you have too much of it, the DNA is not stable anymore. And that causes cancer. And that's why telomeres are so important. So where, where are you from? And tell me all about where, where did you come from different parts of the world? I'm yes. from the University of Regensburg. Yes. And I'm interested in DNA methylation uh -huh. and repetitive sequences. Oh, great. And what about you? Yeah, so I'm actually, I come from Hobart. And no way. <laughs> I know. Still, it gets better. <laughs> I'm just about to submit my PhD. Um, oh, terrific. On good. Yeah, on some malaria research. So looking oh, at good. host susceptibility. Sure. So yes. It's a new yes. type of quite different therapies. Yes. So yeah, yes. about to submit and then come over and work at Pasteur. Oh, good. For a bit. I arrived on yes. Saturday and already yes. Yes. two hours later, I was discussing with different yeah parts of the world about yeah. science and also yes. What makes me sad is when people get very protective about their results and they won't talk about it until it's published, yeah. mm. right? So I've just decided I spill the beans. Yeah. And basically I talk and I don't think there's ever been a time when it was, you know, a mistake to have done that. Yeah. But as it's students, paid. we want to go and, you know, just share and, yes. and tell, and yes. then there's yeah. other yes. people going, no, no, you've got that's to wait right. and hang on. I know. Yeah. My feeling was that's probably a mistake in the long run, and yep. probably even in the middle run as well. And it might seem as though, oh, somebody sort of took my idea, but in fact, it never really happens yeah. either. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they might publish something similar, mm -hmm. yep. and maybe they publish it first and messier. Right, but mm. you publish, and that in the end it prevails. And I think it's well worth it to talk. Science yeah. now is this industrial driven, application driven, yes. maybe also hypothesis forced. That you have yes. to do the experiment yes. again and again until you get the expected result. Isn't that awful? And yes, <laughs> that yes. is just terrible. I know, and I think, <laughs> and so my take on it is what happened was that. I think there was a lot of really ghastly clinical research that was being done, right? It was really awful stuff. And so then people started to say, look, you have to have a hypothesis and you have to do it. And so then the clinical things were started to get sort of formulated. Here's my hypothesis and my job is to prove it. Yeah. No, in science, your job is to see if you can disprove the hypothesis. That's real yeah. science. And But as you say, it got sort of distorted into this, here's my idea and now I'm going to do everything I can to make my data fit this, which is so distorting. Yeah. But I think there's also a problem with grant writing because when you yes. apply for funding you already have to you know, have this know plan for the next but, uh, year. Uh, okay, like okay. Germany, yeah. so. But let, let's get this clear about you know grants. I mean I have a very clear idea. There's, there's two worlds. There's called science and there's called grants. Okay? okay? <laughs> yeah. They coexist. Mm -hmm. They are not the same. Yeah. And mm. the biggest mistake is to mistake the two for the one for the other. You can't sit and write a grant application and say, well, I think I might find a new enzyme. Doesn't go down well with the review sections, okay? Uh, but you can have wonderful funding which opens up the possibility, which says, 
Let's look at how telomeres work. And I'm so grateful to a funding agency like the NIH that said, you have a grant that's called Structure and Function of Telomeres, and within that, I could run with the question. The person who used to run all the grants from the NIH, he once said what's happened is that people start mistaking the specific aims for the science. And he said, we all understood that you take the money and run. Okay, that's the idea. You take the money and you run with the science. And he, and he said the tragedy now is that study sections now, you know, they got very sort of picky and said, oh, they didn't do their specific aims. But the whole point was nobody's ever penalized for going and doing something interesting and not finishing all their specific aims. When somebody comes to you with a really interesting question that just grabs you, and you think that person is good at that kind of research, go for it. So we started a collaboration, and this was wonderful because our friends uh, in the UCSF um, Department of Psychiatry were very interested in chronic stress, and we found, lo and behold, that we could interact and show then people, in which chronic stress, by the way, is a known risk factor for common diseases, such as cardiovascular, that telomere shortness was associated with chronic stress. When I started collaborating with Alyssa, who's working with people who are in really awfully hard situations, yeah. right, you know, mothers of chronically ill children, caregivers of, you know, their husband or, you know, partner or somebody who has dementia. I mean, yeah. these people are under major long-term stress. The patients are being looked after and the caregivers are being ignored. Yeah. During my PhD thesis, I developed a method which enables the analysis if genes are switched on or if they are switched off. The great advantage of this method is that it works on repetitive DNA, such as telomeres. We had this question that we want to answer, yes. but there was no method okay. yes. to use. It was kind of risky because I established a new method. What was the, the method? What was it about? Um, we call it epicombing and it's about DNA methylation and yes. repetitive yes. sequences. Yes. Okay. And with the methods that are established so far, you can't yes. look for DNA methylation patterns. Right. So at individual repeats next yes. to each other if they yes. are epigenetically linked. Oh, on, on the same molecule. On the same exactly. molecule. Exactly. Oh, so you're using combing to... Uh, yeah, exactly. Oh, so nice. do you know the method combing? Sure, yes. What was the epi part then? <laughs> yeah, we, um, before doing the fish, yes. we do an immunofluorescence with specific antibodies against uh, DNA methylation and also against yes, DNA yes. hydroxymethylation. Got it, terrific, yes. So you're yeah. covering the uh, hydroxymethyl C's and the 5-methyl C's basically. Exactly. Yes. Her recent research showed that environmental factors such as stress shorten telomeres. And other studies showed that environmental factors are able to switch genes off and on. So therefore, I hope that she can use my method to analyze if genes around the telomeres can be switched off or on by environmental factors. I would love to do that with this chronic stress. Yes. If the link, yes. if, if the link of these environmental factors yes. might be DNA methylation and subtelomeres. That? Yes. Because I, there, I, are, there are other right. studies that already right. show that DNA methylation plays yes. an important role yes. in uh, stress yes. Uh, development. Mm. Yes, and your method might be even more important because people have been looking at DNA methylation in the subtelomeric regions. There was a meeting That's recently yeah. and they looked at some of the mutants in people mm. who have very short telomeres and so on. The answer was extremely confusing, mm. okay, but of course they mm. weren't using your method. With the normal methods, the you thing. measure an average of exactly. thousands of cells, exactly. the average of exactly. all chromosomes, exactly. and the average of individual repeats yes. on a chromosome. Right. So right. what you right. measure you is just an average. Uh, you'll miss the everything. pattern. You'll miss the pattern of methylation, exactly. and, and the pattern and may be the key. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. I'm sure Elizabeth Blackburn didn't hear about the method I developed before because it's not published yet, and I'm sure she can use it in her lab. So while I'm working on malaria research, which is an eternity away from telomeres and what Elizabeth does, what I'm looking to Elizabeth for is the same idea, we're both cell biologists, we both started with cell biology, and with malaria research we take it through and try and translate it. And that's kind of what Elizabeth's done, she's taken some basic cell biology and taking it through to the clinic.
We didn't hear what yeah. you were doing. So malaria. What, what, malaria, but, but you said there's interesting new avenues yeah. for therapy. Well, instead of targeting the parasite, you know, yes. mutates, it overcomes it yes. so quickly. Yes. What about the host factors? The yes. parasite steals host yes. factors. Yes. Mm. And so yes. as an honest student, I was throwing this yes. crazy idea, Claire, what about host-directed therapy? Good. Off yes. you go. It <laughs> was a little bit, ooh. Okay. Yes. And everyone's like, don't do that project. And, and then come to when the they end, say don't do it, then the you think, that again. sounds like a good one. Yeah, <laughs> right. yeah. and so I've identified yes. these factors and yes. we found some drugs yes. and now we've gotten it through from the cells to the mice Very into exactly. the people. Very so exactly. that's what I'm going to pass dirt to do. I grow up the parasites and I, I try and kill them with these new drugs. And so as a student, being able to take it through and now... Um, looking towards the clinic and how this is applied in people and getting it to the people that's needed. It's an exciting thing. But I think the other interesting thing is, you know, when do you start collaborating in terms of, you know, do you do it early in your career, do you late? I mean, I didn't do any of the clinical stuff till, you know, the late, late yeah. 1990s. Mm. And, um, and I think you really have to become very, you know, you have to be able to bring something to the table. Yeah. Your, your expertise, exactly. I think you want to develop a deep expertise. So I do it in phases, right? So I was very, very hardworking, early sort of yeah. phases. And then, and then uh, you know, I got pregnant, right? And so, okay, so now our son was born. And so, of course, now the science got complicated because now you had to be much more scheduled. <laughs> you just had to organize it differently. And, you know, it's crazy to lose a scientist because of a few years of when, you know, there's intensive need for having children, it seems crazy you throw away a scientist because that person is going to be busy with family for just a few years mm -hmm. and then you've thrown away them being a scientist for the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make sense. Yeah. No. It was amazing. Yeah, it was such a great experience. Yeah. She's all about um, sharing the ideas rather than keeping science secret. So much in science now, everyone hides what they do before they publish it. She doesn't yeah. think like that at all. Yeah. It's really refreshing here, a scientist that says, I don't care, I'm going to share this and let's get the new knowledge out there. Yeah. So. She instantly realises the impact of my established method, that she really liked it and said that it will answer so many unresolved questions. So even though I don't necessarily work on epigenetics, mm -hmm. um, a, a wider genetics group back in Hobart, yeah. um, we're doing kind of similar stuff and Karina's new technique would be um, very useful. So maybe Karina should come to Australia. Yeah, I'd love to establish it in Tasmania and, you know, educate and inspire and connect. That's what <laughs> it's all about. <laughs> Well, I think Claire and Karina are, are clearly, clearly terrific, you know. They, they have success written all over them and uh, they've already done research in which they've really taken the initiative. The kind of attitude they've had is what's going to bring them success in the future.